a YouTube program review today and we're going to finish the one that was sent by Lawrence. So we stopped at the Wednesday last time. Keep in mind that this is someone who wants, uh, wants to develop his legs, but he wants a silver era or golden era physique. He already has a lot of strength on the upper body because he is really advanced on calisthenics. So keep that in mind for the advice I give because it, it is relevant. So on Wednesday, he does rest, light cardio and rehab work, which is fine because he has uh, Monday and Tuesday training days. So he's taking a day off in between. If you're going to do something that resembles the type of program where you might have four or five days, it's of course beneficial to take your day off in between, especially if a portion of the weekend, like the Sunday, for example, is also off because that is also going to serve as a period of time that you can rest. It's less beneficial to do five days in a row and then rest two days, in my opinion. It's much better to do two days, rest one day, three days, or three days, rest one day, two days. Because you really don't need two full days off to fully recover. And that logic can be applied to any aspect of it. If you train three days, I would greatly encourage you to do one day training, one day off, one day training, one day off. That way you actually get a full recovery and you can up the frequency, volume and intensity. If you only rest one time a week, it doesn't really matter anymore, but actually it does because it depends on how you schedule the week. If you end up doing most of the lower body stuff and heavy stuff at the end of the week, it makes much more sense to take your rest day as a Sunday, for example. So he does his stuff, but he still stays active. That's a good thing. If you have a day off, it doesn't mean that it's a day where you become a couch potato. You can do some mobility work. You can do, uh, you can even train quote unquote and just do the body parts that you neglect. Like you can do a day where you do calves, neck and forearms. That's possible. You can do some cardio. You can go swimming. You can do whatever. On Thursday, he does his second upper body day with dumbbells and calisthenics. And he does weighted pull-ups. So he does two sets of 10 to 15 reps, same progress scheme. That's, that's a little bit high for uh, weighted pull-ups for the simple reason that you're already very strong and you've already developed a strong ability to replicate effort because you can do a large amount of calisthenic uh, non-weighted pull-ups. So for someone like you to push progression and to force your body to adapt, you're going to have to be more intense than that. So I would say three sets, of something like a three to five or a four to six or a six to 10, if you want to stay with two sets would be more beneficial in the long run. Because yes, you are doing more volume here, but you've already done a ton of volume for the upper back with pull-ups. You need intensity now to push progression. Then he does weighted dips, two sets of 10 to 15. So same logic. I don't know why you like high reps on these movements. These are strength movements. And it doesn't mean that you should never rep them, but for the most part, they should be treated as something to be done with higher parameters of intensity and lower parameters of volume, or at least that's the way I prescribe them because it's beneficial for progression. Then he does, the, as far as this movement goes, he does a vertical pull and then he does an horizontal press. Those are great movements. You're not going to superset them with anything, although I would say that in reality, weighted pull-ups and weighted dips because of the recruitment of the cardiovascular system, which is quite minimal, you can superset them with light stuff like calves or neck or forearm is perfectly doable. Even shoulders, you don't need to just treat them as their own thing by themselves. After that, he does chest supported dumbbell rows on an incline bench, which is very important because the issue if you do them on a normal horizontal bench is you might find yourself having to limit the range of motion and the stretch of the lat to not touch the floor if it's not a bench that is specifically created for sill rows. And you also find that on an inclined bench, the way the arms hang tend to also recruit different parts of the back. And I've heard many people say that they get their best upper back contractions from an inclined bench. And usually those people tend to use a, a barbells, but you use dumbbells and that's still perfectly fine. Four sets of 15 plus reps at the moment. Okay. Cause he maxed out the dumbbells and he would usually like to stay in the 10 to 12 reps. Okay. So you maxed out the dumbbells. That's an issue. I don't know how high the dumbbells go in your gym, 
But something like a chest supported dumbbell row is much harder than a normal row because you cannot use your legs. So if you maxed out your dumbbells, either you are just ludicrously strong on that movement and you can rep 120 pounds for one, each arm or you, your gym is just not well equipped. So uh, now I understand why you go high reps on this. And I would agree that a 10 to 12 would be much more beneficial for a set, four sets range. You can always add fat grips to make it harder to grab. You know, it would just help with forearms and that way it would be a little bit more challenging. But yes, you need heavier dumbbells. And then dumbbell bench, four sets of 10 to 15 reps. Same thing, the dumbbells are too light. Right. Yeah, you really have a problem with the dumbbells then. You can replace those movements. As I said, if you have a barbell in your gym, you can use a barbell instead and just do a normal flat bench. That being said, I would not have you do a normal flat bench here because in my opinion, a way they put up supersetted or rather uh, within the same training session as a heavy barbell row is fine because it's vertical and horizontal and the vertical pull doesn't tax the posterior chain. But here, if you do heavy dips and, and even just remotely heavy barbell bench, you might develop uh, a level of pain in your shoulders because they're both very demanding. So stay with the dumbbells. You could even do flies, I would say, because they have an ability to open up the chest and you can't use as heavy as a weight. So that could be good for you. Or you could do slow negatives on those dumbbell presses, which would artificially make it harder. You pick. Then you do dumbbell seated overhead press, three sets of eight to 12. That's good. That's a lot of work for the shoulders. I would say maybe pick one, either the dumbbell bench or the dumbbell overhead press, because it's becoming redundant. You have now three press movements in the same workout. And we're starting to get into the issue of repeating effort that was not beneficial to do in the first place, which explains why it's repeatable. Pick one, pick one or two movements and progress on them. You don't need to put every single thing that exists on the same day. And then superset dumbbell one arm lateral raises, leaning away with a pull. So that's amazing. That's the way I do them. And to me, it's the superior way to do them because you can actually take the traps out of the movements and focus on the rear and medium delts. And then upright rows with bends, excellent supersets. That's going to smoke your traps and rear delts. Four sets of that, very good. And then he does, you do 10 to 15 reps for both arms, same as Monday. I've explained to you that if you want to progress, if you want bigger arms, you need to trade, treat the arms like the rest of your body. You need to apply parameters of progression, intensity, and volume. You can't just do fluff stuff and get a pump and hope that your biceps are going to grow. You need to treat them with kindness and with effort. But for the rest of that day, I have nothing to say. I do think it's a little bit too long. I think there's an extra compound movement that shouldn't be there. I do think you could beneficiate from doing straight barbell uh, overhead press because I see that you don't really do that in your training at all. So that would be a good day to do it. And uh, I think that weighted pull-ups, weighted dips, and overhead press, they already take care of all of that stuff. And you can superset, for example, the either the weighted dips or the, the overhead press with ch chest supported dumbbell rows. You can superset the weighted pull-ups with eh, some calf work or ab work if you wanted. Some leg raises would be extremely good with that movement. And then you can just finish your day with a big giant set of dumbbell seated overhead press. Uh, sorry, the, the dumbbell one arm lateral raises and the, the upright rows. And I would even say that now I, I know which movement you could put with the weighted pull-ups or even with the chest supported dumbbell rows. You could have your heavy bicep movement or long head of the tricep movement and slap it as a superset. That way you don't even lose any time. On Friday, lower body number two, you do barbell back squats, four sets of six to eight, good rep range. CC squats, three sets of 10 to 15, good rep range as well. CC squats, uh, I personally don't do them because my knees cannot take them. If your knees can take it, do it. Understand that it's a dangerous movement for the knee, not because it's dangerous per se, it's, an, it's a movement pattern at the end of the day, but it's an exaggerated knee flexion, meaning that it puts a ton of stress on the knee. And it makes a lot of sense because it puts a lot of stress on the quads. Anything, anything that has the potential to grow a muscle has the potential to destroy the structure around it. So be careful. This is why I said that 10 to 15 is actually a good rep range because 
That way, you will always be able to sense the, the what I call in my language, la rep de trop, which is the, that extra rep that you're going to do and you're going to get injured. If you do a three, by, three to five, it's much harder to see that rep coming. If you do 10 to 15, it's much easier. Then you do hamstring curls, four sets of 12, 12 to 15, good rep range. And then you do lower back plus plus abs, four sets of 15 to 12 to 20. Okay, good for the abs. I would say, however, that if you have the ability to do uh, weighted hyperextensions, I would suggest weighting them and pushing the intensity and progression on them. Stick to 8 to 12 reps, but you will find that you can really progress fast on it. If you keep doing body weight, at some point, your lower back and glutes and armstrings will not respond anymore because it's too easy. So this is actually a solid lower body day, right? The only thing I would say is it might be a little bit too focused on the quads. I would like to see a heavy hip hinge. And the issue is that for your Tuesday, I also saw that there was already a little bit of a focus on quad and you don't want to develop a quad imbalance. One second. Sorry about that. So, where was I? So yes, I, as I said, you do stiff leg Romanian deadlifts on the first lower body day, but I would advise you to start doing more hip hinge, uh, hip hinge movement, especially if you don't have an issue with them. Don't leave them on the table. They are so good for, of course, the development of the posterior chain, but also even the development of your upper back. This, this is free, uh, free hypertrophy for the upper back. So don't let them go. I would always tell people to do them instead of doing um, leg curls, for example, because leg curls only grow the arm strength. You can get much more benefits in terms of hypertrophy if you do a normal hip hinge. And I also don't see you doing normal deadlifts, which I don't know if you've told me why or not. You, s Yeah, I see here that you're supposed to be deadlifting because you have a one rep max on the deadlift, but where is your deadlift in the program? I don't see a deadlift. So you need to have a day that is dedicated to deadlift, and that could be a good day. Because the Tuesday is already focused on the barbell back squat. So why don't you start the Friday with a deadlift, then you do a variation of the barbell back squat, and maybe a variation of a hip hinge, and you're covered. You could go home then, instead of having to do all of these movements on top of that. You can still do your lower back and ab stuff, but I, and I encourage people to focus on compound movements for the lower body. And it doesn't mean that you're going to kill yourself with it, but keep in mind that it's the best way to grow your legs. You're going to be limited by the structure in your lower back, but you need to find a way around it. That's, that's the way building your legs work in reality. The legs will grow as long as we find a way to work them without getting injured. And then on Saturday, it's your last day and it's your third upper body day. And it's an upper body calisthenics and phases. So I, I suppose this is going to be a more technical, meaning that you're going to focus on the technical skills. And you do ring pull-ups, three sets of 10 to 15, slow reps. Then you do ring dips, three sets, 8 to 12, slow reps as well. Mixed grip pull-ups, okay, three sets of 8 to 12. Handstand push-ups, deficit. So basically a lot of highly technical uh, calisthenic movements. I don't really know what to tell you for that day. Because on one hand... Yes, you might need to keep practicing those movements to stay good at them in terms of raw practice. But I also think that since calisthenic movements and bodyweight movements has, have such a low price to pay when it comes to recovery, you really don't need to have a full day for them. You could take all of these movements and just split them in your other days so, you, so that you do maybe 15% of them on that day and then that day and that day. That way you also get more practice in because keep in mind that you'll have more frequency because you can repeat the movements throughout the days if needed. And with the way I reworked your program, you now have a lot of space because I took a lot of things away. So when you do your, because uh, you tend to like to do that and I also like to do that, you finish your days with easy giant sets where you just move and move and move and get a good pump, which is not your main mean of progression because I explained to you that it doesn't work but it's always additional volume and it's always good just for your ability to handle work and your work capacity. So that's where I think you should be putting those movements instead of putting them on a Saturday that you could actually use as a proper arm day where you would actually do a heavy bicep movement, a heavy long head of the tricep movement, focus on the forearm, maybe focus on another area of the body. You could do upper back on that day 
And I also think that those movements, and that's talking from someone who doesn't understand, not understand, but has never been able to put into practice weighted calisthenics. I've only just started weighted calisthenics, so I'm not super sharp on it, but I would think that if you want to get good at those movements and push the technical mastery of them, just repeating them within rep ranges that are not challenging is not going to do much. Because I do think that you are at a level where you've already mastered those movements. You don't need to keep learning. You're already at the peak of technicality. So unless you're telling me you're going to program and progress on these movements by applying variations that are harder on the rings, for example, then I would think that what you're doing is wasted effort. You should be wa uh, weighting those movements. You should actually use weight for these movements so that you could actually apply resistance to them. That's just my two cents. But if you tell me that you use that Saturday as just a day to get back into the, the rhythm of things and you don't want it to be too taxing, I would understand. But that would be my advice for you because you have physique goals. You want to look like a bodybuilder. And I can tell you that calisthenic athletes look like calisthenic athletes. They don't look like bodybuilders. You need to develop that upper back and not just the width of it, also the thickness. You need to work on those straps, and that is going to come from heavy pulls, heavy shrugs, heavy rows. You need to develop those legs, you need to develop the armstrings, the calves, you need to develop the, the small muscles of the arms that give that bodybuilder look. Because if you don't, you're just going to be a calisthenic guy that is sort of decent at powerlifting movements, but that doesn't make you a bodybuilder. So I'm going to leave you with that, Lawrence. If you have a comment, I will pin it. Any question, I will answer. Have a good day.